Good morning. Good morning. And Happy New Year <laughs> and Advent greetings, because today is the beginning of the new church year, right? We have to wait a little longer for the regular calendar year, but we begin today with the season of Advent, which comes to us from a Latin word meaning coming from the future to the present. And that which comes to us in Advent is the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. And during the next several weeks, we anticipate that, and the kids are going to help me this morning with that, in terms of the Advent calendar, each of the candles represents a particular Sunday and a particular religious understanding. So it's good to be with you. Um, my name is Craig Anderson. I am a retired bishop of the Episcopal Church. Actually, the gerund is more accurate. I'm retiring. Uh, I became a bishop in 1984 and served in the Diocese of South Dakota for several years before being asked to come to New York and be a bishop there and to head up our seminary there. But I have a, a, a special love for this congregation because in many ways it is part of my heritage, my Lutheran heritage, and also my family was here. Several years ago, shortly after 1984, my grandmother, Cora Elva Krogh Anderson, died and I officiated at her funeral here, at her burial rite. And then, um, Many years ago, my father, who was a member of this congregation, Alvin, more known as Babe Anderson, died and had a chance to officiate and be a part here as well. And then over the course of the years, um, had an opportunity to do other things with relatives. Um, Lori and Scott Moss, I officiated at their wedding many years ago. And I recognize many of you as friends and, re and relatives. I've discovered in returning to Minnesota that I have to watch what I say because every other person is a relative. <laughs> um, but this is, uh, and if you think of the church as the family of God and that we're all related through baptism and the Holy Spirit, we are related. In Lakota language, which I learned when I was a, a bishop here, the greeting is always mitakuye awasi, mitakuye awasi, which means we are relatives, relatives with one another, relatives with the four-legged, well, relatives with the earth itself. Uh, and so it's good to be with you, my relatives, because we are, as the Lakota say, a tioshpae wakan, which means a holy family. And I think that's the primary understanding of who we are as a church, as a people of God. I also recognize some folks out there that I've known over the years. Eldon and Carol were there when we deconsecrated that beautiful little church in Eidskog, um, and others here as well. And, and I, I'm a little nearsighted, but I'm hoping to meet you and greet you when we celebrate the third sacrament of the Lutheran Church. Do you all know what that is? Coffee. Coffee hour. Right. <laughs> You've got it. And I thank, thank you for that. Um, Liz is with me, my wife, this morning. Liz, stand up and say hello. Yep. And we made a decision some time ago to simplify and downsize and just become a part of my ancestral community in Odessa, Minnesota. You all know where that is, seven miles east of Ortonville. I don't think they like that designation, but nevertheless, that's it. And so we've returned to um, our ancestral home where my great-grandfather, grandparents were for many years and are planning on living there and, be, and have become Minnesota residents. And I have the driver's license, the license plates, and the tax bill to prove it. <laughs> uh, 
So it's good to be back. And um, in returning, it's also been a joy to recognize the special relationship that the Episcopal Church, the Anglican Church in the United States, and the Lutheran Church have in terms of shared pulpit and sacramental ministry. And when we arrived in April, Bishop, the then Bishop John Anderson, no immediate relative, but all these Andersons are related, <laughs> asked me to serve um, and be a rostered bishop and pastor um, in the Lutheran Church, ELCA. And so I'm now officially not only related to you, but a part of the church here as well. And in so doing, I served as an interim in churches in Appleton, Zion, Oregon, and Minnesota Valley for six months as a way of reintroducing myself to how you all worship and how you understand who you are as a particular brand of Lutheranism. So in that, uh, now that I'm official, officially a resident and officially a member and pastor and bishop in the uh, Lutheran Church, again, it's good to be back, and we'll explore that a little bit later. I also want to welcome all visitors and guests. We're pleased that you're worshiping with us today. Look forward to meeting you, if you are new, in the coffee hour afterwards. And we pray that the joy of Christ will fill you as we worship and celebrate the beginning of this Advent season. There are friendship pads at the end of each pew. Please fill those out. Send them to the other end and back again, if you would, please. We'd appreciate that. And all are invited downstairs following our worship for coffee and fellowship. And today's KDIO radio broadcast is sponsored this week by your gifts to the Endowment Fund. Special thanks to our lector, Brent Zarbuck, who will be serving as lector. If you haven't already, please pick up your stewardship packets and envelopes in the narthex. The Advent giving tree is up in the narthex. I think you saw it probably when you came in. And on December the 18th, there will be a Christmas can cantata at 3.30, followed by a Scandinavian-inspired luncheon. Any Swedes, Norwegians, Dane here? Raise your hand. <laughs> Lefsa, Ludifis, right? That'll be a part of that. Look forward to that. Good. So please come to that. Um, and today is the last day. I'm reading here some of the announcement that uh, Pastor Denise asked me to share. Today is the last day to give your input on your favorite hymns. If you haven't already, write three of your favorite hymns on the forms at either entrance and place them in the form in the baskets. Volunteers are needed for the Christmas Eve services. Please contact the church office if you are interested in helping. Are there other announcements? If so, please stand up. And Any other announcements? Okay, let us... Um, I, I know in some churches it's a tradition to stand and sing... Others to sit and sing. What's your tradition? Well, you're already up. Let's sing. <laughs> the opening hymn is Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, hymn number 254. I'm sorry, what? Oh, candle lighting. It's easier for me to adjust to you than you to me, so we'll do candles now. The Advent. Advent candle. Come and, somebody come and light the first one, please. My acolyte and helper here, he's keeping me on track. He left. <laughs>
I think. Now let's sing <laughs> hymn number 254. the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Please be seated for the opening prayer. <coughs> Stir up your power, Lord Christ, and, and come, come by, by your merciful protection. protection. Save, Save us from, from the threatening dangers of our sins, sins and, and enlighten our, our walk in the way of salvation. Of for you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. First reading this morning can be found on page 489 of the Old Testament in the Pew Bibles. The visionary message presented in this reading focuses on a future day when God establishes a universal reign of peace. Divine decisions will make war obsolete, and the worshiping community responds, 
Let us walk in the light of that Lord now. A reading from Isaiah, the second chapter, beginning with the first verse. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many peoples shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, he shall judge between the nations, and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading this morning can be found on page 124 of the New Testament in the Pew Bibles. Paul compares the advent of Christ to the coming of dawn. We live our lives today in light of Christ's coming in the future. A reading from Romans, the 13th chapter, beginning with the 11th verse. Besides this, You know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for flesh to gratify its desires. The word of the Lord. Thank you, Brent. At this time, I'd like to invite the children to come forward and help me with my sermon. Come on up, kids. Have a seat here, and we'll... Come on, girls. Don't want to, that's okay. (laughs) Well, today is a very special day, and I'm going to ask you to help me with my sermon as we think about why it's special today. Do you know why? Yeah. What do you think? Hi, hon. Come have a seat. Yeah. Sit with these other girls. Do you know why it's special today? It's getting close to Christmas, not too far away, isn't it? Huh? Well, we've been through Thanksgiving, but we're kind of between Thanksgiving and Christmas, aren't we? It's the season in the church year called Advent, and there are a number of different ways that we celebrate that. One is right over here. Do you all know what that is? We just lit one of these candles, huh? You want to come take a look? Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about that. Because each of these candles that we'll be lighting each Sunday represent different things in terms of kind of the birthday of the church. Because this is the beginning of a new year and the birthday of the church. The first one that we lit represents hope. The things that we hope for, maybe that you might find under the Christmas tree, huh? The things that we hope, what's that? Yeah, it's getting tall. 
And then each of the Sundays, there's a different word that we use and talk about in terms of what Advent means. And I'm going to ask you to ask your parents and friends what those words are. And if you don't get an answer, I'm sure the pastor next week will tell you as well. But this one's for hope, what we hope for. And then the center one, isn't that bigger? Hmm? It's white, different color. Sometimes there's a pink one in here too, but the center one is called the Christ candle. And we light that on Christmas Eve to recognize the birth of Jesus, his birthday. So it's a birthday for the church for the next month or so, and then it's going to be Jesus' birthday on Christmas, right? Good. Now, the second thing I think would be helpful for you to help me with is to let the parents know what you hope for during Advent. Is there anything in particular that has kind of been on your mind that you hope for in the next few weeks? Hmm? No? Hmm? I heard, what's that? New barrettes? Yeah? Okay. (laughs) What else? Anything else, kids? Well, what we hope for as a church family is for peace in the world, for peace between nations, especially given some of the things that are in the news that aren't happy things, peace among one another, and a chance to come together and to celebrate the coming of Jesus at Christmas and to wait for his coming by thinking about things that would be helpful for us as individuals and members of God's family to hope for. So thanks for your help, and uh, I hope to see you again sometime in the next few weeks, okay? Great. Now, as I understand it, you're going to do the noisy offering, is that right? There it is, right over there. Go ahead. Is it up there? Okay, that one. Very good. Now, you all know, folks, that birthday requires presents, so give generously. Why is it called a noisy offering? Because you put coins in a bucket and it makes noise. Very good. Please help. Okay.
got it all here. Okay. I see why it's called noisy. Yeah. <laughs> all right, good. Go ahead. <laughs> Right.
Thank you, Lil. Give him a hand. I got to know our soloist uh, by virtue of the fact that her father is helping, I should say, actually doing all the hard work planting trees at our ancestral home in Odesta. Josh, good to see you and your family. Thank you, Liv. If you're able, please stand for the reading of the Gospel. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. About that day and hour no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. So too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together. One will be taken and one will be left. Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known in what part of the knife the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. In the name of the Creator and Sanctifier and one who continues to be present to us, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. My sermon this morning is in a couple of parts, and I'm given to understand by pastor, uh, your pastor that you like your sermons to be around 25, 30 minutes, is that right? <laughs> But the, the sermon really is, first of all, wishing you again a happy birthday as members of God's family, the church, and then inviting you to think about the meaning of, of Advent for you personally and members of the church family, and then a little reflection on what that means, and then finally what we are called to do in preparing during, the, during this penitential season uh, for the coming of Jesus and his incarnation as our brother, as our Lord, as our Savior. So Advent, as I mentioned, and the, the, the children helped me here, coming from the Latin mean, coming not so much from the past, but coming from the future, inviting us to be ready for his presence. The season is a penitential one. That's why the color purple or blue, as you have on the hangs on the altar, it's often been called a mini Lent, a mini Lenten service, because what we are invited to do during the season of Advent is to follow our Lord in terms of his ministry. And I guess one way of summarizing that ministry is one word, reconciliation. Jesus came into the world as the Son of God, representing his Father, born of his mother, to reconcile us to God, to reconcile us to the earth itself as stewards of the earth, to reconcile us to one another. And my friends, my brothers and sisters in Christ, if you've been reading the news, 
I can't think of a year where there's more need for reconciliation. Huh? Reconciliation with the earth in terms of climate change, reconciliation with the nations in terms of what's going on in Ukraine and other parts of the world, reconciliation in our own country politically with the animosity and sometimes the just sheer meanness of how our political leaders can't sometimes come together and be reconciled and work for the common good. I continue to be concerned about the fact that no sooner have the elections taken place, rather than carrying out the mandates of what our elected leaders promise to do, they start worrying about the next election. And what they're really called to do is to work across the aisle, if you will, and follow what reconciliation leads to and that's cooperation and working together. Reconciliation within our families, sometimes broken families, sometimes families that disagree. Exacerbated, I suspect, by differences of sometimes religious opinions, political opinions. Hmm? I know in um, as I think about the past, I remember my grandfather, Ed Menzel. Um, he sort of oversaw the Menzel farms in this area. And his brother Chip and his father Richard. And my grandfather was a Republican. My father, on the other hand, was an FDR Democrat. And the thing I used to enjoy as a child growing up was as we would gather, as we did on Sunday mornings after church, and I would listen to them argue, but with a good spirit. They would talk about different things that they believed and each of their parties represented, and I learned a lot as a child listening to that, to appreciate both parties and the need to work together. But what stands out most was they did it with respect for one another. No name calling, occasionally a little humor actually. And as I sat there as a young child listening to that, I could see the merits of both understandings of what it is to be a member of God's family, what it is to be a member of our country. And I guess I recognized that in carried it with me when I served in the military as an infantry officer and later as a chaplain. The need for reconciliation of differences of opinion, the need for reconciliation differences within our own church sometimes, and for us to come together and reconcile ourselves by virtue of the fact that we have been reconciled to God by Jesus, the Son of God. So that's one way of thinking about it. And I guess another thing that I want to share with you is a, a theologian, a Lutheran theologian, who is aware of the fact, while, and I agree, that there's a need for ch separation of church and state, that the church is ultimately political. So let me share with you a quotation from Richard Newhouse. Some of you may be familiar with him. Um, a Lutheran pastor and theologian who said, and I quote, politics is chiefly a function of culture. At the heart of culture is morality, morality. And at the heart of morality is religion. Most of our beliefs, politically and otherwise, are grounded in our religious values. And the religious value that Jesus came and embodied and incarnated was reconciliation, our coming together and not being divided. Also, Aristotle made it pretty clear, if you want to hear a political understanding of that. 
Politics is the deliberation of the question of how we ought to order our lives together. Politics comes from a word that means the health of the community, the health of how we get along. We can disagree if we disagree in love and respect. And that's what we're called to do during this Advent season, to be reconciled. And I invite you, and I guess that's the second part of my sermon this morning, I invite you to be agents of reconciliation in your own life, in your personal life where you feel division and hurt and sorrow, in your own families where they're in division, within this community perhaps where there is division, for us to come together and to be guided by a moral compass as suggested by Newhouse and Aristotle, to be guided in doing that which is good for the community the upbuilding of our nation, peace in the world, and care for the land that has been given us in trust. Advent. How many of you have Advent calendars in your home? Hmm? Where are the kids? Okay, I see one. Yeah, good. Another way of marking the days of Advent is to have an Advent calendar. And if you have one, great. If not, it's a wonderful thing for our children to make. And each day reflect, maybe light a candle at home if you have an Advent wreath at home, to reflect on the day and what the day promises for us as we prepare for the coming of Jesus in that manger, in that stall, in that, that little place, very humble, in Bethlehem, a long time ago. I'm always struck by the fact that uh, the first witnesses to the birth of Jesus with Mary and Joseph were four-legged. Hmm? Cattle, sheep. And Jesus was in a humble little stall, nothing fancy, no big hospital, no fancy hotel, and those animals were the first witnesses, not the three wise men. They came at Epiphany, right? But what a wonderful image. That humility coming as an agent of reconciliation, promising the hope for that. We gather this morning to celebrate that, to ready ourselves for the next month Buying presents and doing all of those things is important, but the primary reason for us this season is to come together as God's family, all of you, to share with one another the love of Christ that we anticipate, and then go out of those doors into this community and into this world and following the work of Jesus who came to reconcile us to one another, who came to save us from our sins, and who came to love us and to help us love one another. I think that's not quite 25 minutes, I apologize. <laughs> I want to conclude with a uh, poem that I found very helpful. A good friend sent it to me. Uh, it's a prayer from the daily prayer of the Carimelia community in Northern Ireland. And you all know some of that division and so forth. And here's the prayer. Where there is separation, there is pain. And where there is pain, there is a story. And where there is a story, there is understanding and misunderstanding, listening and not listening. May we, separated peoples, 
estranged strangers, unfriended families, divided communities turn toward each other and turn towards our stories with understanding and listening, with argument and acceptance, with challenge, change, and consolation. Because if God is to be found, God will be found in the space between. Amen. Our service continues with the Apostles' Creed. Please stand if you are able. Together, I believe in God, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and died, was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, 
the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we prepare for the fullness of God's presence, let us pray for the world that yearns for new hope. Our congregational response this morning is, hear our prayer. God of all, your children everywhere cry out for mercy. Awaken the global church to the urgent needs of our time. Break down barriers of culture and custom and unite people of all faiths in your redemptive and healing work. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of wonder, the earth's beauty and abundance is your gift. Teach us your ways of sharing resources and caring for life. Guard fragile habitats, preserve the wild places, and protect endangered plants and animals. God, in your mercy, God of peace, you judge the nations. Beat our weapons into tools for serving the neighbor. Strengthen the resolve of all who work for an end to war. We pray for lasting peace in the land of Jesus' birth. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of loving kindness, you deserve or you desire fullness of life for everyone. Fill those who hunger, comfort the grieving, and attend to those near death. Bring help and hope. To any who are sick or needing your care, especially Carol, Ken, Arlen, Mark, Gail, Harris, Brandy, Mick, Paul, Baby Rosie, Larry, Natalie, Baby McCoy, Zane, Brian, Janice, Jerry, and Terry. Our Fairway View neighborhood friends, Ruth, Eleanor, and Aletta, all our military who are deployed to areas of conflict, and those that we hold dear in our hearts. God, in your mercy, God of community, you are present when we gather in your name. Guide congregations in transition or conflict. Give wisdom to congregational councils, call committees, and ministry leaders. Keep us alert to unexpected opportunities for mission. God, in your mercy. God of promise, your goodness is everlasting. We give thanks for the lives of the faithful who now rest in you. We trust that you will bring us into the company of all the saints with rejoicing. God, in your mercy, God of our longing, you know our deepest needs. By your spirit, gather our prayers and join them with the prayers of all of your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Silently or aloud at this time, as we pray for one another, that we might follow the example of Jesus. Let us pray. O God, hear the prayers of your people, and let our cry come unto thee. All this we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Our service continues with the offertory hymn, Rejoice, Rejoice, Believers, hymn number 244.
Eternal God, you make the desert bloom and send, send springs of water to thirsty ground. Receive these simple gifts of bread and wine and money and make us messengers of your mercy and love for all in need of your healing and justice and reconciliation. We ask this through Christ our Savior. Amen. And we pray together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please stand, if you're able. God, the eternal word who dwells with us in Jesus and who holds us in the grace of the Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. We now go in peace as we sing together the closing hymn, Soon and Very Soon, hymn number 439. Reconciliation and children of God. Hallelujah! Hallelujah!